Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this East Bay Mud Water Wednesday. My name is Christopher Trito, and I'm a public information representative at East Bay Mud. If you have an interest in local history and regional development, or just want to better understand where your water comes from and how it arrives at your tap, this webinar is for you. The East Bay Municipal Utility District has quietly shaped much of our region's growth and development over the past century. The district is a not-for-profit public agency that now serves 1.4 million water customers and 740,000 wastewater customers across two of the nation's most dynamic counties. But today's complex system traces its origins to a patchwork of efforts by civic visionaries, entrepreneurs, and land developers scrambling to supply fresh water to a growing population. This evening, we'll learn who built East Bay Mud, how the delivery of safe and reliable water supplies helped transform the East Bay, and how East Bay Mud is preparing for its next 100 years. Along the way, we invite you to ask questions. If you move your cursor toward the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A icon. Please click on Q&A and then type your question in the window that opens up. We'll answer as many as we can at the end of our presentation. I'd also like to remind everyone that we are recording this presentation and we'll upload it to East Bay Mud's YouTube channel. You'll be able to view it later by searching for East Bay Mud Water Wednesday. Now I'm happy to introduce our presenters. Clifford Chan has served as East Bay Mud's 11th general manager since June, 2020. As general manager, he balances the continued demands of maintaining critical infrastructure and financial stability with innovation in sustainability and long-term water and wastewater planning. Clifford has been with East Bay Mud for 25 years and holds degrees in civil and geotechnical engineering from UC Berkeley. He has a keen interest in regional history and made East Bay Mud history himself as the first Asian American to hold the position of general manager. Fred Etheridge serves as an assistant general counsel at East Bay Mud. His responsibilities include advising East Bay Mud on complex water rights matters and related environmental law issues. He negotiates water transfers and represents the district before the State Water Resources Control Board. Fred received his, his bachelor's degree in political science and environmental studies at UC Santa Barbara and then earned his law degree from the University of Utah. He's a member of the Association of California Water Agencies Legal Affairs Committee and the California State Bar's Environmental Law Section. And finally, Jose Setka is the Environmental Affairs Officer for East Bay Mud and has worked on McColney River Fish and Wildlife Management for 30 years, primarily as part of the Fisheries and Wildlife Division at East Bay Mud. He coordinates with state and federal agencies, environmental organizations, and stakeholder groups to help manage natural resources within the McColney River watershed, East Bay Mud's primary source of drinking water. Jose holds a degree in fisheries and wildlife biology from UC Davis. Thank you all for being here. Clifford, let's begin with you and learn a little bit about the early developments that led to the formation of East Bay Mud and the people who made it happen. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight. Um, so in about a year, um, we're going to celebrate our 100-year anniversary. Um, and I think we've all heard the saying that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So to understand who we are and why we do what we do, you have to go back over 150 years, 50 years before East Bay Mud was formed, and understand how the communities in the East Bay grew and got their water. And as I share our history with you, you'll start to better understand the challenges we face today, our priorities, and how we're looking ahead into the future to see how we th can do things better. Now, I do want to acknowledge from the get-go um, that we're going to share with you a brief history of the development of water in the East Bay and the region. There's just too much to cover in 40 minutes. So we do plan to share more of the history, both the good and the bad, in future Water Wednesdays and in stories that we'll share leading up to our centennial. Next slide. So 
So the development of water companies in the Bay Area began with Anthony Chabot. Chabot was born in 1813 uh, and raised on a farm near St. Hyacinth in Quebec. He was one of 16 children, the son of a farmer. When he was 14, he ran away from his boarding school. Now, I don't know if this part is true, but the story goes that he walked the 400 miles from Quebec to New York City, where he hoped to find more opportunities. Now, ironically, his first job was working on a farm in Manhattan. His next job was at a tannery in North Carolina unloading cattle hides, uh, and then he was a freight operator on the Mississippi. But like so many others, when he heard about the discovery of gold in California, he packed his bags and headed to the Golden State in 1849 to stake his claim in the foothills. But instead of making his fortune mining for gold, he and another man devised the first hydraulic mining technology. It consisted of a wooden contraption held together by iron clamps that allowed miners to direct water using a canvas hose to break up gravel and wash it into a series of sluices where the heavy gold flakes would settle out. Now, for those of us familiar with hydraulic mining, this caused severe environmental damages, scars that we still live with today. Now, he left mining in 1856 and went to San Francisco. And there in downtown San Francisco, he saw people hauling water in carts from a well at the Grand Hotel on Market Street to their homes. And based on his hydraulic mining experience, he knew there was a better way. So he and several partners started the San Francisco Water Works, the city's first water system that brought water from Lobos Creek near the Presidio to reservoirs on Lombard and Francisco Streets. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so not long after, he turned his sights to Oakland where he also felt the water supply was inadequate. And he started the Contra Costa Water Company in 1866. Now, originally he wanted to dam Sausal Creek, but he couldn't secure the land or the water rights. So he turned his sights to Temescal Creek and built Lake Temescal. Now in a theme that would occur again and again over the decades, it became obvious that the area was outgrowing its water supply. And even as Temescal Dam was being completed, Chabot was already looking for additional water sources. So he turned to San Leandro Creek, um, it had a good dam site and it had sufficiently large watershed, but it would take years to construct. So in the interim, he drilled wells throughout Oakland in Temescal at the intersection of Claremont and Telegraph Avenues and on 14th Avenue. And finally, by 1875, he finished construction of Lake Chabot. <clears throat> now, some of you might also recognize Chabot because of the Chabot Space and Science Center in the Oakland Hills. In 1883, he donated an eight inch telescope and the funds to build an observatory. Now, originally that observatory was called the Oakland Observatory and was located in Lafayette Square near 11th and Jefferson in downtown Oakland. That observatory eventually moved to a location off of Mountain Boulevard in 1915 because of all the light pollution in downtown Oakland and then moved again in 2000 to its current location off of Skyline Boulevard. Now the Lafayette Square location, interestingly, also had a chronometer and served as the official timekeeping station for the entire Bay Area. Next slide. Anyway, so getting back to water, um, who built Lake Temescal or Temescal Dam and Chabot Dam? Well, in 1979, East Bay Mud had a project to upgrade the spillway at Chabot Dam. And while we were digging, we unearthed a century old Chinese encampment buried in the creek embankment. And students and professors from Cal State Hayward excavated over 60,000 artifacts, revealing the life, diet, and work habits of the over 800 Chinese laborers who worked on the dam. They found soy pots and stoneware rice bowls and rusting pieces of metal tools similar to the ones used by the gold miners. So we speculate that hundreds of Chinese men probably drifted down from work on the railroads and the mines. Now the Chinese worked for less than $1 a day. There was very little evidence in all the archeological digs of any architectural remains that might represent structures. So we also suspect that the laborers lived in tent cabins, and you can kind of see a drawing of that in the bottom left. Now the Chinese cleared over 330 acres of vegetation. They blasted 3,100 feet of tunnels. They built more than 15 miles of road and moved 600,000 cubic yards of earth. 
And then they ran horses and mules across the dam to compact the soil during construction. This was backbreaking work. Um, and there were also skilled Chinese workers who constructed the fine masonry finish on the dam surfaces. So when we asked who built Temescal Dam and Chauveau Dam, it was the Chinese who built some of, of the first water systems in, this, in the East Bay, and it was the Chinese who helped build those dams. Next slide. So with the construction of Lake Temescal and Lake Chabot, the Contra Costa Water Company temporarily addressed their water supply issues, but they were also dealing with complaints about water quality. In 1870, there was a newspaper article that complained about the offensive smell of the water, and they feared the water would not only affect people's physical, but also their mental condition. And the article stated, quote, the muddy condition and the terrible stench of the water now serve to openers renders it fearfully nauseating even to the strongest stomachs. But people were still moving in the area and developers were still building homes to meet the demands of the growing population. About a decade later, there was a real estate agent and developer named William Dingy. He had an office near the Contra Costa Water Company in Oakland. Dingy was developing homes in the Montclair and Piedmont Hills, and he asked the Contra Costa Water Company to supply water to those homes and they turned him down. Next slide. Oh. Is this the next slide? Okay. So that didn't stop Dingy. Um, following the advice of a local civil engineer who had a theory that large amounts of water could be found by drilling in the Oakland Hills, he bored two tunnels and 210 feet into the hillside, water started gushing out. With that supply of water, in August of 1891, Dingy formed the Piedmont Springs and Water Company. By January 1892, he built a four million gallon reservoir shown in that red circle on the bottom right, uh, which is still here today. Eventually he reorganized the company and called it the Oakland Water Company. Next slide. You can move to the next slide. Okay, I don't see it, but I'll keep going. So when, with Dingy's new water company, the Contra Costa Water Company faced the one thing that it never had to contend with before, and that's competition. Dingy originally wanted to serve Piedmont, but he discovered that the Contra Costa Water Company had tied up the Piedmont customer base with long-term contracts. But the southern part of Oakland was poorly served. And over the next year, he laid water mains, signed up customers, and started plans for his company to serve all of Oakland. To do so, we require more water. So he bored more tunnels and began drilling more wells. Neither the Oakland Water Company nor the Kachikas Water Company could set their water rates. That was done by the city. And in 1893, the Oakland City Council, after months of political wrangling, set new rates that were 30% than the year before. Now, neither Dingy nor the Contra Costa Water Company liked it, but they had no choice. The city council then passed an ordinance stating that the Oakland Water Company would supply water to all the fire hydrants in the public buildings west of the center line on Broadway and instructed the Contra Costa Water Company to disconnect themselves from that area. By the spring of 1897, neither company was receiving more than half their legal rates. The Contra Costa Water Company suspended dividends for several years, and their stock had fallen from about $100 to about $20. Now, in order for the two companies to survive, they had to merge, but the Contra Costa Water Company didn't want to merge. Then in 1897, nature stepped in. It was the beginning of a three-year drought. Water levels in Lake Temescal and Lake Chabot fell precipitously. This was a straw that broke the camel's back, so the stockholders voted to purchase the Oakland Water Company. And after the merger, the Contra Costa Water Company was headed by Dingy. And I, I like this photo because it shows a drawing of Dingy's office back in the late 1800s. And this is what the building looks like today if you look at the photo on the right. Next slide. So I wanna give you an example of how the development of the community as we know it today was related to water. Like Chabot and Dingy, 
developers and builders had to find a water source. It could have been groundwater or creeks in the area. So let's take UC Berkeley as an example. UC Berkeley was established in 1868, but before there was UC Berkeley, there was a Contra Costa Academy, which is, was established by Henry Durant. The Academy was later reincorporated as the College of California and was located in downtown Oakland, right next to Chinatown. In the mid 1800s, <coughs> excuse me, the College of California was searching for a suitable campus to move to. They chose a location in Berkeley next to Strawberry Creek because they felt that the creek could provide a year round water supply. They hired Frederick Olmsted to develop a campus plan and to dam Strawberry Creek. Now Olmsted was finishing his work on the design of Central Park in Manhattan. The College Water Company was formed to build the dam and reservoir on Strawberry Creek. Now, for those of you familiar with the campus, the dam was located just above Memorial Stadium. At the same time, the state of California wanted its own university, so they created the University of California. The state wanted to create an agriculture and mining college, so they approached Henry Durant to see if he would let the state take over the College of California. Now, the College of California was having problems. They had the land, but didn't have enough money. And the state had the money, but no land and no college. And eventually Durant agreed, but one of the conditions he placed on the state was that the new university had to have a college of letters. And for those of you familiar with UC Berkeley, um, it's now the College of Letters and Science. And you also might recognize Durant because there's a building named after him, which is the office for the College of Letters and Science. Now the College Water Company became the University Water Company, but the University of California wanted to get out of the water business. So they were taken over by the Berkeley Real Estate and Waterworks Company, which eventually became the Berkeley Waterworks Company. Now that company was owned by Felix Chapelet and Henry Berryman. And there's a street in Berkeley named after Berryman. And we also have a reservoir named after him as well. Next slide. Frank C. Havens was an attorney uh, and a major real estate developer in Berkeley, Piedmont, and Oakland. Havens business partner was Francis Smith, the Borax King. Now together they created the Realty Syndicate. Now you might not recognize Havens or Smith, but you'll certainly recognize the projects they built, which includes the Claremont Hotel, the Lakeshore Highlands, and the Crocker Highlands in Oakland. At one point in time, the two men owned over 13,000 acres of land from North Berkeley to San Leandro. They also built a local transportation system because they believed transportation would increase the value of their real estate. They started and ran the key system rail line. Now, one of their lines was the B Transbay line from the Trestle Glen area. That rail line was replaced by the B bus route in 1958 and subsequently was sold to the AC transit system. Now you can also blame Havens for all the eucalyptus trees in the East Bay and Oakland Hills. Havens imported millions of eucalyptus seedlings from Australia with a grand plan to plant a rapidly growing hardwood forest to use for construction. Under his direction, the Mahogany Eucalyptus and Land Company planted somewhere between one and three million eucalyptus seedlings in the East Bay Hills. Now what he didn't know at the time was that eucalyptus trees were unsuitable for construction. In early 1906, the Syndicate Water Company was formed. It was an offshoot of the Realty Syndicate. And to meet the growing water demand, they purchased water rights on Sausal Creek. And at the same time, they filed a claim to the water rights on San Pablo Creek, the site of the future San Pablo Dam. Next slide. Now the Contra Costa Water Company didn't want the Syndicate Water Company to expand. And so they took them to court. But by that time, the Contra Costa Water Company was near bankruptcy. And in 1906, after the earthquake, the People's Water Company was formed, combining the Contra Costa Water Company, the Syndicate Water Company, and the Richmond Water Company. Havens resigned from the Realty Syndicate to become the president of the People's Water Company. Next slide. The effects of the earthquake caused an even greater squeeze on water supplies. After the 1906 earthquake, a lot of people moved, a lot of people moved from San Francisco to Oakland. In fact, the population of Oakland doubled. So the People's Water Company set a goal to increase their water supply by 100%. Now, the other problem they had to deal with was the condition of our distribution system. 
The People's Water Company inherited a piping system that was badly outdated, poorly maintained, and undersized. Just to give you an example, 50% of the water mains in Berkeley were less than four inches in diameter. So they embarked on an expensive and extensive upgrade of their distribution system. Next slide. One of their projects was to expand water storage. Um, to expand water storage was the construction of Central Reservoir in Oakland. This reservoir is still in operation today. Next slide. And to give you a sense of the size of Central Reservoir, Memorial Stadium would fit in the footprint of the reservoir with room to spare. Now, the other thing that People's Water Company brought to the East Bay was water meters. Before then, water companies didn't measure how much water people used. Next slide. But by 1916, the People's Water Company, like its predecessors, were, was having financial difficulties. The company was sold and reincarnated as the East Bay Water Company, not to be confused with East Bay Mud. And the East Bay Water Company was run by Wigginton Ellis Creed. So who was Creed and how did he end up running the largest water company in the East Bay? Well, Creed, who before he got into the water business was a principal at a grammar school in Fresno. He got a call from Darius Ogden Mills, who you may recognize as a person Milbray is named after. Mills was a banker, an investor, and a philanthropist. In the late 1800s, he invested in a power company in New York and needed someone to help with the business. So he asked Benjamin Wheeler, who was the president of the University of California for a recommendation, and Wheeler recommended Creed. Creed agreed to work with Mills and learned about the business and finances. And while he was in New York, he studied law and got his law degree. He eventually came back to Oakland and as a lawyer handled a case between Oakland and the water company over water rates. Creed did such a good job that when the East Bay Water Company was formed, the owners asked him to run the company. He reluctantly agreed. And Creed ran that company for four years before he became president of PG&E. Next slide. So as the East Bay Water Company grew, they installed lots of pipes. This is a photo taken in 1921 of a pipeline crew near Josephine and Rose Streets in Berkeley. Um, and this pipe is still in service today. Next slide. Drought and the lack of an adequate water supply persisted. Um, this is a photo of the water shutoff men at the East Bay Water Company's office on West Grand and Adeline. They were sent to shut off the water supply to customers uh, who are wasting water. Next slide. So to deal with the lack of water supplies and meet the growing demands, uh, the East Bay Water Company built San Pablo Reservoir. Next slide. And they built Upper San Leandro Reservoir. But even as they were building more storage, local private industries also tried to address their water needs on their own. Just as an example, the California Hawaii Sugar Company, that's the CNH factory that we see as we drive across the Carquinez Bridge, drilled their own wells and barge water from the Delta. And in 1920, they also contracted with the Marin Water Company to pipe water in from Marin. All right, so we have an opportunity here to take a, a short break and and pick your brains a little bit. So we have a trivia question. We wondered if you, anyone would like to respond, please feel free. Um, the question is, what is East Bay Mud's primary water source? We've been learning a lot about these early sources and reservoirs. What is our primary source today? The Russian River, the Mokolmne River, or the Tuolumne River? I'd like to take a check, you can see how you do. Well, most of you have got it right. The McColney River, 75% answered correctly. Congratulations. Uh, sounds like you know a little something about East Bay Mud already. Great. Take it away, Clifford. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. So a fundamental conceptual change was happening in the early 1900s. You see in the 1800s, the water business was localized. There was little interaction between major cities and the companies were controlled by personalities like Dingy and Chabot. By 1900, water had become big business. 
companies consolidated and merged. And people began to recognize that the cost of new water supplies required greater resources than private firms could provide. And the struggle for new water supplies forced regional solutions, both on the local and state levels. And in 1921, George Pardee headed a committee for public ownership of water supplies. And in 1921, the California legislature passed the Municipal Utility District Act, or the MUD Act. And in 1923, the people of the East Bay voted to establish East Bay MUD. Now at the time, Richmond and Piedmont were the only two cities that didn't approve joining East Bay MUD, but they were allowed to join a few months later. Now, one of the first tasks was to find a more reliable and higher water quality water supply. So they brought in Arthur Powell Davis as the first general manager and chief engineer of East Bay Mud. Davis was a hydrographer, an engineer, a geographer, and a topographer. And he was one of the co-founders of the National Geographic Society. Now, initially, East Bay Mud was approached, and they turned down an offer to join San Francisco's Hetch Hetchy Project, which was actually fortunate because the Hetch Hetchy Project wasn't completed until 1934. So before summer was out, Davis brought in Major General George Washington Gothels, the builder of the Panama Canal, and William Mulholland, the father of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, to help them out. They turned to the Sierras, and they looked at the Eel, the Upper Sacramento, the Tuolumne, and the McCullumy Rivers. And Davis, Gothels, and Mulholland finally decided that the McCullumy would be the cheapest and the quickest to develop. Next slide. So La Chaplana, which is Spanish for a flat boat, was a river crossing along the McCullumy. The area was founded by Mexican miners in 1848. Um, but I do want to go back a little further. The area was originally inhabited by three Native American groups, with the Plain Miwoks being the predominant group. The Plain Miwoks lived in the western Sierra Nevada between the Fresno River and the Consumnes. Now, McCullumy is Miwok for people of the river. The Spanish began exploring the area in the late 18th and 19th century. And around 1830, they settled near present day McCullumy Hill as an outpost for fur trappers. The Miwoks in the area were displaced from their home. Many succumbed to illness, uh, they were relocated or they were enslaved. And even more were displaced by the Mexican ranchers. And this is another piece of the history of the region uh, that deserves its own story. And it's a story that we'll tell uh, at a future um, date. Anyway, so the construction of La Chapana began in the 1920s. The dam was completed in early 1929 and water from the dam flowed into San Pablo Reservoir on June 23rd, 1929. And this really couldn't have come at a more critical time. The two prior years in the East Bay had low rainfall and the reservoirs were noticeably low and the groundwater supplies in the area were severely overpumped. Next slide. To house, all, to house all the workers who were building the dam, a small community was set up in Campo Seco. Campo Seco was an early mining camp. Now this town was destroyed by fire in 1854 and some of the settlers rebuilt while others left. Gold mining was never big here, but in the late 1800s, those that lived started mining for copper and quartz. And just like the damage hydraulic mining did to the environment, we also had to deal with the environmental damage caused by all the copper mining. Anyway, um, you can see on the photo on the right, um, uh, some of the early stages of the construction of the dam and the photo on the left shows some of the homes that were built to house the workers. Next slide. This is a photo of Party Dam in the spillway today. And at the time Party Dam was completed, it was the tallest concrete dam in the world. Now Party Dam is named after George Party, who was the 29th mayor of Oakland, the 21st governor of California, and the president of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors from 1924 to 1941. Next slide. So you can find the history of water in the East Bay throughout our community. If you look at the streets today, at the gate pot covers, you'll see signs of all the water companies that came before East Bay Mud. So when you look at those gate pots and you see EBMUD, that's East Bay Mud, but you'll also see Contra Costa Water Company, CCWC, or PWC for People's Water Company, or EBWC for East Bay Water Company. And you'll see places throughout our community with links to our history, from the Chabot Space and Science Center to Chabot Elementary School in Oakland, 
to Berryman Street in Berkeley or Party House in Oakland. And these are just some of the examples of our history in the community. And the reality is that much of our community was built around water. Next slide. So the story of East Bay Mud is about a growing community that had issues with making sure we had enough water for our customers, making sure the water quality was good, managing costs, maintaining our infrastructure and protecting the environment. And we were formed when the water companies before us failed to do that. And so what you see on the right is our mission statement. And it really reflects what we've learned from the past and we, what we must continue to do if we wanna be here for another hundred years or more. And that's that we have to manage our natural resources. We have to provide reliable, high quality water and wastewater services at fair and reasonable rates. And we have to preserve and protect the environment. So if you look at our mission, fundamentally, we're a public health and environmental company. Now, one of the challenges we have to deal with is that much of the infrastructure was inherited from all the other water companies. And much of that infrastructure is still in service today. Next slide. So I just wanna take a quick moment and tell you where our water comes from. 90% of our water comes from the McCombie watershed in the Sierras. It's stored in one of two reservoirs in the Sierra Foothills, Party Reservoir, which I talked about, and Comanche Reservoir. Party Reservoir is our main drinking water reservoir. And Comanche Reservoir is used for flood control and managing environmental flows. That water travels 90 miles through three aqueducts across the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta and ends in Walnut Creek. Now, what you don't see here is the Freeport facility that we can use in dry years, just like this year, uh, that takes water off the Sacramento River. We built that facility to improve our drought resilience. Next slide. We provide water service to 1.4 million customers in Alameda and Contra Costa counties, and we provide wastewater service to about 740,000 customers. Our service area covers 332 square miles, and I'll put that in perspective, that's seven times larger than San Francisco. Now the hatch area you see to the left is our wastewater service area that covers 88 square miles. We have a large and complicated system. In fact, it's probably one of the most complicated systems in the nation. We're the second largest water retailer in California and the 12th largest in the nation. Next slide. So we have 4,200 miles of pipes just about under every street in the East Bay. And to put that in perspective, if you strung that pipe end to end, you can go from the Oakland A's Stadium to Chicago's Wrig Wrigley Field and back again. Now, one recurring theme, um, oh, next slide, sorry. One recurring theme over the last 150 years are droughts and how we can ensure we have an adequate mm -hmm. supply of water. And the effects of drought we know are being exacerbated by climate change. Now, I briefly mentioned the Freeport facility that we use as a supplemental drought supply. But the story behind how we came to access that water is an interesting one. And I'd like to pass it on to Fred to tell that story. Great, thanks Clifford. Yeah, I will be talking about EB Mud's American River Supplemental Supply. It really began in the, in the 1960s. EB Mud was looking for a new source of water in addition to those that Clifford just outlined for you. And that was in part due to the rapid growth and the post-World War II era, demand, water demand was rapidly increasing and EB Mud looked ahead and said, well, the McCallamy and our local sources are not going to be enough. And in addition, while the McCallamy River is an outstanding source of water, very high quality, it's a small, relatively small water basin, such that when the winter storms come through, if a storm track misses the McCallamy, misses our, our tiny little watershed basin, it can make a significant difference in the amount of uh, rain and snow we get in that basin and what our water supply will be in the, in the following year. So for those reasons, in 1970, EB Mud entered a water supply contract with the United States Bureau of Reclamation. It goes by the name of the Bureau for short. The Bureau operates the Central Valley Project um, and that's a network of canals and reservoirs in California. You're probably familiar with uh, Shasta Reservoir, I-5, when you drive up um, Interstate 5 uh, through Northern California, you go right over Shasta Reservoir. And that's the, that's the bureau, one of the Bureau's reservoirs in the Central Valley Project. It also operates Folsom Reservoir, uh, just east of the city of Sacramento. And the CVP provide, the Central Valley Project provides water to agricultural lands and also municipal users. Now the district's contract with the Bureau in 1970 was for 150,000 acre feet of water from the American River. 
And that term acre foot, it's kind of a funny one, it actually goes back to the 1800s. It's an agricultural unit of measurement for water. It's one acre of land with a foot, a depth of a one foot of water on top of it. Uh, and it's a good time for a quiz. So how many households can an acre foot, which is about 325,000 gallons of water, serve in one day? We have one, we have four, we have six. What will it be? The poll is churning. Going once. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, good try. We have a lot of guesses for six, but uh, our correct answer is four households in the East Bay Mud Service Area are typically served by uh, an acre foot in a day. So go, it goes a long way. Um, now, if we could go to the next slide, please. We're going to talk about the, the district's initial plan. You can see here in the top center, there's a, a lake in blue called Folsom Lake. Great, thank you. And you can see the, the, the white, the red dot there. Folsom Lake is on the American River. In fact, if you take drive on Highway 50 from Sacramento up towards the Sierras, you'll pass right by Folsom Lake. It's gonna to be to your left, just to the north. And just downstream from that, you see Lake Natoma. That's a much smaller lake. It's formed by Nimbus Dam, also on the American River. And it's the headwater or it's the diversion point for water into the Folsom South Canal. And that's the canal that, yes, it goes south towards the McCallum River. So EB Mudd's plan when it signed this contract in 1970 was that its diversion point would be at Nimbus Dam. It would take the water from Fol down the Folsom South Canal to the McCallum Aqueducts and then would go to our west to our service area across the Delta through those aqueducts that, that Clifford showed you a picture of a few minutes ago. So that was East Bay Mudd's initial plan. But not everyone was happy about that plan. In 1972, the Environmental Defense Fund, which is an environmental group, as well as Save the American River Association and Sacramento County, filed a lawsuit to challenging East Bay Mud's planned point of diversion at, uh, at Nimbus Dam. And if we could take the cursor back up to Lake Natoma, thank you. If you follow that the American, American River to the west, and it joins up with the Sacramento River right there, Discovery Park in Sacramento. That reach of rivers, commonly called the Lower American River, is very heavily used for recreation, including whitewater rafting and other forms of water recreation. And it's an important fishery. So it, there are many claims in the case, but the gist of it was that EDF argued, look, this is an inappropriate point of diversion because you'll be taking 150,000 acre feet of water off the American River so that it cannot flow down through the Lower American and provide all these benefits. If this diversion happens at all, they argued, it should happen downstream off the Sacramento and where the, where the cursor is now and not on the Lower American. For E.B. Mudd's part, it argued that the water quality was much better higher up on the American River so that it made sense purely from a public health water quality perspective to take the higher quality water at Nimbus Dam take it through Folsom South and put it into the McCallum Aqueducts. The case was heavily litigated, not, not just for years, but for decades. It went, it had a long complicated procedural history. It went up to, from the trial court to the California Supreme Court, from there up to the US Supreme Court, back down to the trial court, back up to the California Supreme Court. That's a very complex history. And finally, in 1990, um, if we could do the next slide, please. Judge, Judge Hodge from the Alameda County Superior Court issued a decision, Judge Richard A. Hodge, and it's commonly called the Hodge Decree. And what he did was balance all the, the, the contentions and arguments of the parties in the litigation. He didn't absolutely ban East Bay Mud from diverting at Nimbus Dam into the Folsom South Canal, but he did put stringent requirements on those diversions, essentially set in-stream, they call them in-stream flow standards, but he said, look, the following quantities of water must remain in the Lower American River um, must be in the river and remain there for, in order for EB Mud to divert water under its CVP contract. And the quantity of flows that he required be in the river varied with the time of year, which corresponded to both the recreational use and the fisheries life stages. 
So that and even went through that we resolved the matter, but for the a solution, solution was still dif difficult. The disputes continued and the project was simply not moving forward. So finally, um, around the year 2000, so 30 years after East Bay Mud got, initially got its contract uh, for American River Water, a solution was reached and a partnership was create, uh, created between East Bay Mud and the Sacramento County Water Agency. Those two agencies actually collaborated to build the Freeport uh, we call it the Freeport Project. It's a regional water facility. You can see that on the right there. It's right on the Sacramento River. It has state-of-the-art fish screens, and it's operated by both the, the Sacramento County Water Agency and East Bay Mud. Sacramento County takes water off the Sacramento River at Freeport in, in uh, all year types, and East Bay Mud takes it just in dry years. The facility cost almost $1 billion in 2008 uh, dollars, and Another uh, change I should mention, in, turn, in, in addition to moving its point of diversion from Nimbus Dam, Dam down to Freeport, East Bay Mud also modified its contract to make it a dry year only contract. So EB Mud can only take its CVP water when uh, it, it's in a dry condition and that dry condition is defined by the contract. Um, and in addition, the amount of the contract was cut from 150,000 acre feet to 133,000 acre feet. So if the partnership works well, it's been in place now for over 10 years. It allows Sacramento County to divert needed supply at a state-of-the-art facility. And critically, it provides East Bay Mud with an absolutely necessary dry year supply diverted at that same Freeport facility. Can we have the, the next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, I wrap up my section uh, talking about the need for water. EB Mud assesses its water supplies and both its existing and projected future demands for water to determine its need for water. The, the thing about water, and you probably gather this from Clifford's presentation, is you can't turn on a dime and decide, oh, we, you know, we've we've exhausted our existing supplies, we need more water next year. Let's build a major new project. It takes a long time, as evidenced by the um, 20 odd, almost years of litigation on the American River contract. It takes a long time. To, to put water projects together. So UBMUD engages in long-term planning and its need for water is driven by its different customer groups. You can see single family residences, multifamily residences, commercial, industrial, institutional uses. All those uses together, uh, both now and, in, and projected in the future, drive East Bay Mud's need for water. So we need to be able to provide water to our customers in our service area. In addition to that, EB Mud has a decades long water conservation and recycling programs as part of its efforts to stretch its water supplies. Um, and it does, I'm gonna use an acronym here, but it does what it calls its WSMP. That's the Water Supply Management Program. That is a decades long um, water planning effort looking at far ahead to, to estimate both what East Bay Mud's future demand will be and what water supplies it can um, pull together to meet those estimated demands, given the long lead time it takes to actually bring water online. It, its most recent WSMP, about 10 years old, approved in 2012, it looked at expanded water conservation, expanded water recycling, as well as water transfers, desalination, you probably read about desalination a lot recently, um, and groundwater. And so it's, it's, a, it's a good effort and it builds resilience in EB Mud's water supply. We don't put all our eggs into one basket, we have multiple uh, supplies. We think of it more as a, a portfolio approach, um, and it's and it's served us well. I think it did just recently in the in this current drought that we're in. EB Mud did utilize its CVP contract starting in October 2021, last fall through March uh, 2022, just a few weeks ago. It drew about 34,000 acre feet of water um, under its CVP contract um, through the Freeport facility to East Bay Mud. So that wraps up that section on the American River. And I think now I'll turn it over to Jose Setka. Jose, if I can interrupt for just a second, I do wanna clarify something. We had some sharp eyed uh, viewers in the audience who pointed out our slip up that uh, an acre foot of water is approximately enough to supply four households in the East Bay for a year, not for a day, but for a year. It is a lot of water. And uh, just to give you some perspective, we have made dramatic improvements over the last several decades in terms of water management, efficiency, uh, so that now we are at about four households uh, use that much in a year. 
back in the 70s, it was, that was enough to supply only about one household with all the uh, inefficiencies and lack of water conservation. So kudos to everyone who has done so much to be part of that to save more water and, uh, and kind of really take care of the supply that we have. Thank you, Fred. Thanks. Jose, uh, it's all yours. Okay, you can pop up the next slide there. Um, so as Clifford's already kind of alluded to, as we dove into looking at the history of East Bay Mud, um, there is just so much to cover with an agency that's, you know, nearing 100 years old and the fact that, you know, how our, our infrastructure is set up and, you know, taking water from the Sierras over the Bay, that, you know, to do a true justice in terms of talking about the history within the Sierras and Bay Delta, we're going to set up a different session to do that. So just kind of think of this as just a, a primer for that future session. So, um, but basically, you know, when you look at the history of the Sierras, you know, the McCullough River provides benefits for a wide range of use, uh, uses. You know, we've talked about the water supply benefit. That's not just here locally within the Bay Area, but also for the communities within, within and along the um, McCullough River. But there are also many other benefits that it provides from environmental, which is something that I'm uh, more familiar with, to, to things like cultural benefits for not only the local residents, but also the, the, the previous local residents who still reside there, the tribal communities and, and folks that really depend on the river much more than just for water and food. They have a much better connection <clears throat> to, the, um, to the river. And also recreation. Recreation is huge on the McCallum River, not just there locally on the system itself, but the salmon that are produced from the system provide wide range benefits throughout the state including you know, providing a significant amount of the fish caught out in the uh, Pacific Ocean, both from commercial uh, fisher uh, anglers and also recreational anglers. So it's, it plays an important role on a much broader scale than just what you see there you know, in the river. Um, you know, Fred's already covered just a taste of the history of the conflict and litigation. I, I think that's something that goes along with California water and has been there from the very beginnings of it and likely will continue well into the future. Uh, water is a very limited resource. And as things change, I think it becomes even more limited. However, you know, I just want to hit that there's been some collaboration and, and science that has led to success on the McCullen River. And, and two prime examples are the upper McCullen River Watershed Authority and the lower McCullen River Partnership. And what they've demonstrated is that through regional collaboration and bringing in folks and, and, and essentially having a, a transparent approach to how to do business, manage resources, gain input from all types of different uh, viewpoints, um, successes can be had. And I think we've had successes in the upper watershed in regards to some of the forestry management projects that have gone along and certainly in the lower river in terms of looking at uh, some of the habitat improvements and, and, and improvements to the fisheries downstream that I've certainly been a part of for over the last 30 years. Uh, to me, clearly collaboration is, is one of the most effective ways to, to get um, outcomes that are generally you know, beneficial to everyone. Um, when you look at the future challenges, uh, adapting to climate is gonna be a key, um, climate change. Um, you know, we there the precipitation and how it will fall on the watershed will more than surely change, and we need to be ready to adapt to that in, in a wide variety of ways. Some of what we know, some of it is experimental. That you know, we're looking at things that might work. Um, so that is something that we're going to have to work on in the future to make sure that you know these species that we manage will continue to be there. Um, and as I mentioned previously, you know. You know an expanded version of this is going to get into queue for one of our future uh, Water Wednesdays. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and just to highlight one of the uh, key um, successes that we've had on the McCullough River is the, uh, and I say we, and that's a global we, that's not an East Bay Mud we, um, McCullough River Wild and Scenic designation, which was signed into law in June of 2018. It protects 37 miles upstream of Party e Reservoir, um, preserves the wild and scenic values of the river, and it was supported by a broad um, coalition of environmental groups, local community members, 
um, governmental agencies and, and the water agencies. That wasn't what it looked like in the very beginning. I mean, when it first the proposal first came out, there was a lot of opposition, including from water agencies. Um, but as they brought a group together to, to develop a report, basically a wild scenic report that was given to the, to the um, Natural Resources Agency, they worked together to find ways to come to consensus on some of the, those issues that were um, leading to some of the disagreements and, and the lack of support. And I think over a period of time, they were able to build that consensus. And you know, not everyone necessarily goes away from these types of consensus groups you know, getting everything they want. But certainly in this case, I mean, there's not that many wild and scenic rivers in California. And certainly to, to be one of those rivers, I think just highlights where we've gone on the McCullum River from, you know, the early days and particularly, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, where there was a lot of acrimony and a lot of um, litigation going on to where we are today. It's just been an incredible run. And I think hopefully we can continue that in the future through the you know continued collaboration and uh, transparency. And that's that's it for my two slides, and I will pass it back to Clifford. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Fred. If we can go to the next slide. So you know, like I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges we're dealing with is the infrastructure that we inherited. There wasn't some grand plan that laid out how the water system should be built. Instead, it was really just dozens of smaller water systems that over time merged. And about two thirds of our capital budget is invested in infrastructure. And most of that is in replacing pipes and upgrading our water treatment plants. And this photo here is just an example of one of the challenges that we have to deal with every day. Because the water pipes were some of the first infrastructure to go into the ground, all the other utilities from electrical to gas to telecommunications were built over our pipes. Sometimes there are one or two roads also built over our pipes. So when a pipe starts leaking, and we have to make a repair, we have to navigate around all that other underground congestion. And when we're replacing pipes, sometimes it could be hard to find a location for our new pipe. Next slide. Because it's so expensive to replace pipe, on average, it's cost two and a half million dollars per mile of pipe to replace. We spent the last decade looking at new and innovative ways to upgrade our pipes. This includes lining the old pipe, so instead of digging and installing a new pipe, we install a liner in the existing pipe that forms a structural pipe inside a pipe. And areas that are susceptible to landslides and earthquakes, we're installing earthquake resistant pipe. In the past decade, we've more than doubled our pipeline replacement rate. Next slide. I just wanna quickly switch gears and talk a bit about wastewater. This will be brief and we'll have a future Water Wednesday dedicated to wastewater. Um, but you may ask yourself, what happens after you use the water and it goes down the drain or when you flush the toilet? Where did it all go before we built our wastewater treatment plant? Well, before East Bay Mud's wastewater treatment plant, everything went directly to the San Francisco Bay. Next slide. As early as 1936, the Oakland Tribune noted that the Metropolitan Oakland's next big task was to find a method to dispose of sewage that discharged into the bay near the bridge. By the mid-1940s, outbreaks of waterborne diseases, degradation of fishing and recreational water, coupled with wartime industrial development and population growth, made California relook at how water pollution should be controlled. There were articles in the newspaper about the big stench from the San Francisco Bay. So in 1944, six cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Piedmont, and Albany, voted to form a sewer district to be operated by East Bay Mud. Now, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948 was the first major U.S. law to address water pollution. That law was amended in 1972 and is now commonly known as the Clean Water Act. Around the same time, California was making changes to its approach on water pollution control and water quality, and the state enacted the Dickey Water Pollution Act in 1949, which led to the creation of the State Water Pollution Control Board, which eventually became the State Water Resources Control Board. Next slide. So the six cities already had their own sewers with lines draining from the hills to large remains in the flatlands that discharged the bay. So the plan wasn't for East Bay Mud to take over the operation of the city sewers. Instead, the proposed plan called for three large mains or interceptors around the perimeter of the area. 
one starting in Albany to the north, the second from the south near the Oakland airport, and the third from Alameda. And these interceptors would collect the sewage from the existing city lines and bring it to our main wastewater treatment plant near the foot of the Bay Bridge. And in 1951, we completed construction of our wastewater treatment plant. Next slide. So this is a photo of what our plant looks like today. Those large circular structures you see are clarifiers used to settle out and remove solids from the waste stream. This plant has been upgraded over the decades, but much of the plant, just like our water infrastructure, is around 70 years old. Now, about a year and a half ago, we completed our integrated wastewater treatment plant master plan to address the aging infrastructure, new regulations, seismic risk, climate change risk, and drivers, and laid out a roadmap for our wastewater system over the next few decades. Next slide. Um, so this is the last slide. Uh, so the story of the water system in the East Bay and East Bay mud is about how we came together to create a more reliable water supply, address water quality and environmental issues, and do this while still keeping water affordable. And it's also about the people who built our systems and how the delivery of safe and reliable water supplies helped transform the East Bay. Next year is our centennial. And I like the slide because it shows the construction of our original water system and the people who operate and maintain the system today. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight. And at this point, we'll open up to questions. Great, thanks very much, Clifford. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes left, everyone, but we'll try to get through a few of these questions uh, as best we can. Um, Clifford, one that came up was uh, mentioning, you mentioned artifacts that we can still see around the community, including gate pots with different logos on them. Can, someone asked, what is a gate pot? And building on that, can you tell us a little bit more, a little bit more about the infrastructure that is still in service from those early days? There's redwood pipes, I think, from time to time we discover things like that. Yeah, I think we removed the last redwood pipes in our system um, many, many decades ago. A gate pot is just a cover. So when you drive on the street, you see those metal lids. Those are the lids that sit over the valves um, that we have in our pipeline. So that's what we call a gate pot. So as you drive around the streets or walk around and you see those gate pods, look at those initials. Some of them that belong to the water company might not say EBMUD, it may say something else. Great, another question we've received refers to uh, the discovery of the McColney as our water source or the, uh, determining that would be the best one and uh, bringing in Mulholland to help us with that. A lot of people know him from the LA water stories, uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about his role in all this? So yeah, Mulholland and, um, you know, uh, 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 Gothels came in in around 1924 and they prepared a report uh, to you know, look at all those different rivers. Um, I, I know Mulholland had you know, the issue back in 1928 when the St. Francis Dam uh, failed. Um, I think essentially you know, that, that failure pretty much ended Mulholland's career, but that dam failure happened in 1928. Okay. Uh, another question that comes in, talks about uh, the Central Valley and aquifers and groundwater here. Are there any plans underway to try to recharge uh, aquifers underground or uh, work here in the East Bay? Yeah, we have, um, uh, we just uh, finished construction of what we call the Dream Project in uh, San Joaquin County. Um, and that is a project where um, uh, in wet years, we can provide water to, uh, for agriculture. And then in exchange in dry years, we can take water from uh, the groundwater. And so we just completed construction of that pilot plant and we're going to start testing it hopefully uh, soon. Great. And I might be putting you on the spot with this one, but just a local question uh, at UC Berkeley. What happened to the dam on Strawberry Creek? Do we know? Yeah, that, that dam uh, got torn down um, uh, after the, the, the water system started building out. And there was another reservoir that was built just off of Euclid um, to supply the campus. Great. And uh, we'll take one more here as we wrap up. Can you tell us a little bit about the materials uh, that are used in the water mains for the liners and how that technology works? Yeah, so most of the pipe well, the, that was originally installed was cast iron pipe. Um, and it was lined on the inside with a mortar lining. So like a cement lining. Um, after cast iron, you know, at the same time, we also put in steel pipe. So we have steel um, and then, you know, probably in the forties through the seventies, uh, another pipe material called AC pipe, asbestos cement pipe was used. 
Um, today, we're looking at using ductile iron as well as plastic pipe, so PVC um, and high density polyethylene pipe. Great. Well, uh, because of the time, we'll have to wrap up our discussion there. I know there's a lot of additional questions, so uh, we want to invite all of you, if you still have questions, please feel free to send them to us and we'll do our best to answer them. You can send your questions to waterwednesday at ebmud.com, waterwednesday at ebmud.com. Uh, I'd like to thank, thank you Clifford Chan, Fred, uh, Fred Etheridge, and Jose Setka for your presentation. And thanks also to East Bay Mud Senior Community Affairs Representative Mona Favorite Hill and Public Affairs Specialist Christina Wong for your work behind the scenes putting this together tonight. And thanks to all of you for joining us. East Bay Mud is proud to serve the East Bay and we appreciate your participation in Water Wednesday. There will be more to come and we'll see you next time. Thanks for being here.